Pharma Ventures, experts in deals and alliances. Hello and welcome to Pharma Ventures Insights here at On Helix 2017 in Cambridge. Artificial intelligence is creating a buzz around uh, healthcare and biotech and pharma right now. And joining me on today's program is Jackie Hunter of Benevolent AI. Jackie, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. So Benevolent AI, it's, it's, it's hard to, to get a clue from the, the name what it is you guys do. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, what we're really trying to do is to use AI in a very focused and applied way to really revolutionize the drug discovery and development process. I have worked in the pharmaceutical industry for many years and one of the problems that has just not gone away is this high rate of failure for efficacy in phase two but also in phase three it's still 50 percent. So it tells me that we're not choosing the right targets to work on and that must be because we are first of all, not using all the evidence, and secondly, because of the complexity of biology, we've got to be able to do more experiments to be able to test more hypotheses to get to the right target. And I think AI will be able to help with both of those things. So what we're doing is to take the sort of corpus of publicly available biomedical information, together with some proprietary information that we pay to access, for example, patent databases. And then we feed those into a pipeline. We use our very specialized biomedical dictionaries to annotate the entities and recognize them in the information that's ingested into the pipeline. Now about 80% of that information is unstructured. It's, it's free text. Mm -hmm. And Knowing that CB2 is a cannabinoid receptor, not a postcode in Cambridge that the author had, very topical as we're here, um, is, is, is really what we're about in terms of that selective annotation. And you wouldn't believe how many synonyms and acronyms there are in bioscience. When we've done that, we feed that information, look at it with natural language processing algorithms which allow us to look at the context in which those entities occur so we can look at the relationships between entities so that we can know for example that a sentence that says gene x was looked at in expression of cells in alzheimer's disease actually tells you nothing about the relationship whereas gene x is upregulated in cells from Alzheimer's disease is a positive relationship. Then we can use our artificial intelligence to help map those relationships. All that goes into a knowledge graph. And here's where the power of, I, of AI really comes into play. We're actually using that to make inferences about relationships which we don't know exist today, but on the basis of the known information should exist. I mean, a really good analogy is if you think about the periodic table mm -hmm. of the elements. When it was first constructed, there were gaps in it. We knew that elements must exist, we just hadn't discovered them. And eventually, of course, they were all discovered. So we hope by pulling together this information and using all the information, um, that you know, not just from a particular therapeutic area, we'll be able to create better testable hypotheses of new targets in disease or repurposing drugs that have failed in one disease for another and hopefully then be able to create more medicines. Okay, so, so let me ask you a somewhat naive and simplistic yeah. question um, because it's, it sounds great um, but also it sounds, you know, the, 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 the statistical element of it and I'm not a statistician, you know, you, you, you can prove a lot of things with statistics so yeah. you could, if you, if you find the data you can make connections which really aren't there but you yeah. can infer that they should yeah. be there so you can find that people who wear red jackets fall over more and break their legs so yes. don't wear a red jacket because that's causing you to break your yeah. leg it's not it's not connected at all exactly so how do you guard against well, that's, making the wrong connections well, that's why this process is not for a fully automatic process that's where the insight of the drug discovery scientist comes in mm -hmm. and they can look at these hypotheses and and then really interrogate them, bringing their knowledge, 
of biology or chemistry and drug discovery to see which of those really make sense, which right. of these hypotheses are the ones that we will really pursue. And it's, so it's really a case of augmenting the insight of the drug discoverer and helping them to get to you know, a point where they can really validate hypotheses much more rapidly. I remember when I was in the industry, we would decide to work on a target based on some actually fairly limited information. And then you'd probably spend about another year or two years validating that target, uh, creating some reagents, it, even before you did a high throughput screen. We can turn that around in, a, in terms of the actual deciding whether to work on something very rapidly within a, a month. It's then the wet validation that takes mm -hmm. obviously longer because we're doing that in collaboration with people outside of the company. Um, but we can cycle through decisions and programs very quickly. We're also doing that in terms of our medicinal chemistry. Uh, the industry average is like two to three years for lead optimization and probably four to six thousand compounds. In our first program, we did it in one year with 425 compounds, so to, to, to from lead to selecting a candidate. So I think we're using AI at various stages of the process. It's going to take a longer time to be able to validate what we have. But one example, which we started uh, in, in the end of 2015, uh, looking at hypotheses uh, in, in motor neuron disease, in ALS. Mm -hmm. And then over the past year uh, and a half, we, we spent working with the uh, group at CITRAN, which is the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience, uh, and to validate those hypotheses. One high, we, we took five, one didn't work. Three worked somewhat as good as Rilizol, which is the mm -hmm. standard of care in ALS. It mm -hmm. prolongs life by about two to three months. But one really worked well. One, one compound really worked well. And uh, so much so that uh, recently, some recent data, um, the researchers there said it's the most exciting result he's seen in his life. Interesting. So, I mean, ultimately, of course, the validation is in the clinic, so mm -hmm. it will take time. But I think we've got some really powerful surrogates that we are actually doing things differently, and it seems to be working. So a lot of the, the um, presentations and, and, and uh, talks here are about collaborations and, and uh, translation, yeah. are, are you actually seeking to replace the academic end of things and that, that what they do now in the fundamental research on biology you can do with AI? Absolutely not. For a start, the evidence we're relying on is generated in large part through academic research. Mm. When we generate, we are in generalists, I mean each of us in the company has our own specialist area, I was neuroscience. But we can only go so far as generalists. The reassuring thing is that when we've gone to talk to academics who are experts in their area, they, with, with new hypotheses, no academic has said to us that we're completely barking and what we're suggesting is ridiculous. Mm. And they've all wanted to work with us. So, so I think, again, that's very encouraging. But this, the whole thing, there's a lot of hype about AI replacing people. Mm. What I think AI is doing and certainly for the next 30 to 50 years, I think more so, is, is going to be helping people to actually do the jobs they do better in, 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 in biomedicine. Okay, so we, we've talked a little bit about the technical side and what you're actually doing. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the business model for, for Benevolent AI? So the business model is essentially we are using our tech that we're developing for our own programs and projects. We're not a service provider. Mm -hmm. So we're very much in the business of using the technology for ourselves. We will work with, in partnership with companies for mutual benefit. We can do joint ventures. We can entertain buyback rights with the assets that we in license, or we can fully in license assets and the licensing company will get royalties. So our mm -hmm. business model is different from a lot of the other companies in the AI space who are really focused very much on service provision. Right, but do you expect to take entities all the way to market or will you then partner them back out I, I think for, for in certain disease areas 
we would be very uh, we, we would like to take them all the way to market uh, in other disease areas where you need a much broader global reach or it's more of a, a, a GP based um, uh, prescribing scenario then of course we would want to out license them to, to partners who can have that capability and when when do you think we're going to see the first AI influenced uh, treatments reaching the market well, I would like to think certainly in the next couple of years, actually. I so mean, a real rapid in, in yeah, improvement? Yeah, I mean, within the, within the next sort of three to five years, I would hope that we would start to see things okay. actually reaching the market. Well, we'll very much look forward to seeing if that, that comes to pass. And Jackie, thank you very much for joining thank us today. You. Thank you very much. For more information about Pharma Ventures, visit our website.